perhaps we can start. I think most of the people are in. Welcome to uh, the sixth, sixth um, OER Dynamic Coalition webinar in the sixth month of 2021. Um, today we're speaking about a topic which is very near and dear to many policymakers' hearts. It's developing supportive policy for OER. And we're very fortunate today we have a very uh, rich uh, number of colleagues who are here to speak with us. Um, we'll be joined by Dr. Javier Atenas, who's from the University of Suffolk, Suffolk, and he she will speak about how to catalyze open educational policies. And we will this is, will include an examination of the element of OER policy making in the wider framework of open education policies. Uh, my colleague, Michelle Kenmo, who is the CI Communication and Information Advisor from UNESCO Dakar, will be presenting the work done by UNESCO Dakar in implementing the recommendation, the OER recommendation in the Sahel. So therefore, the countries that are covered by the UNESCO Dakar, um, Mali, Niger, uh, uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, of course, Senegal and how uh, the intergovernmental work is being carried out and the support for policy making with the governments in this, in this, uh, in this project. Uh, this will be followed by do uh, Dr. Fong Sun Fuk, who is from the University, University of Malaysia, Sabah. And uh, Dr. Fong will be outlining the process for the development of the of OER policy for inclusive education, that is education for persons with disabilities that has been undertaken by uh, Dr. Fong in, these, um, in, in Malaysia with the government address and how this policy, make, policy process has evolved and the different elements. So this relates also to the element of accessibility and how policy for OER, accessible OER is, um, is an issue that is very important to address. And we have, we'll be uh, finally our colleague, Dr. Catherine Cronin, who is from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland, will be speaking about a national approach to digital and open policy in Ireland and provide a national example. With that, I would like to give the floor to, I think we'll start with Michelle. Um, Michelle Kenmo, who is our colleague from UNESCO Dakar. Uh, Michelle, the floor is yours. Alors, euh, merci pour euh, le privilège de, de cette présentation. J'ai demandé si euh, Eleni pouvait euh, partager euh, son écran avec ma présentation. Alors, euh, pendant qu'elle le fait, je peux déjà vous dire qu'au niveau du bureau de l'UNESCO euh, pour l'Afrique euh, de l'Ouest Sahel, euh, nous sommes euh, engagés dans... Euh, la mise en œuvre de la recommandation de l'UNESCO pour les REL depuis euh, un certain nombre, euh, euh, nombre d'années maintenant. Et je vais euh, me focaliser uniquement sur euh, les actions que nous avons menées au cours des, des, des trois dernières années. Next slide. Euh, ma présentation va être organisée comme euh, il suit. Il sera euh, question de, de parler des objectifs de notre action au niveau du Sahel, euh, de présenter un peu le processus que nous avons mis en place jusqu'à présent au niveau du Sahel. Et après avoir parlé de ce processus, je vais donc me focaliser sur quelques actions concrètes, euh, dont euh, l'étude préliminaire que nous avions menée en 2019, plus euh, le cas spécifique du Burkina Faso, qui pour moi est un cas d'école par rapport à l'engagement du pays vis-à-vis -vis de d'Erel. De, de Et je terminerai par une brève présentation sur le plan d'action euh, que nous avons élaboré au, pour les, les réseaux éducatifs libres au niveau du Sahel. Next slide. Alors, il faut, comme je l'ai dit au tout début, notre action dans le cadre des réseaux éducatifs libres euh, s'inscrit en droite ligne avec euh, euh, les, les, les différents axes d'action de la recommandation de l'UNESCO sur les règles. Et euh, à l'intérieur de cela, nous nous sommes engagés à travailler à la sensibilisation à l'importance des règles. Euh, nous pensons que c'est un axe important, et je vous dirai pourquoi tout à l'heure. 
à renforcer l'intégration et l'utilisation des rêves dans tous les domaines de développement au niveau du Sahel. Euh, je, je, je pense qu'il est important que je m'attarde un peu ici pour dire que de notre point de vue, euh, les REL peuvent bénéficier à divers secteurs de développement au-delà de l'éducation. C'est-à-dire que euh, nous pensons qu'une utilisation stratégique des REL peut bénéficier à l'innovation, peut bénéficier aux jeunes et à l'accès aux compétences, ainsi de suite. Donc, euh, les REL ne sont pas spécifiques au secteur de l'éducation, bien que, euh, tel que son nom l'indique, ressources éducatives, donc euh, l'éducation, euh, montre que c'est d'abord euh, bénéfique au secteur de l'éducation. Mais nous croyons que euh, les libertés qui sont associées euh, à REL, euh, liberté d'utilisation, liberté de modification, d'adaptation, de réutilisation euh, par rapport aux licences que l'on attribue, euh, les licences libres que l'on attribue à la ressource éducative libre, font en sorte qu'on peut faire une meilleure exploitation de manière à ce que les REL puissent bénéficier à d'autres secteurs que le, le, le seul secteur de l'éducation. L'autre action que nous voulons euh, mener, c'est celui de développer un pôle d'expertise pour les ressources éducatives libres. Nous, nous, nous sommes convaincus qu'au niveau du Sahel, il faut si nous souhaitons que la recommandation sur les REL, que l'intégration des REL puisse être une réalité, nous avons besoin de constituer un pôle d'expertise pour la région. Et enfin, entre autres objectifs, notre action vise aussi à contribuer à l'élaboration des modèles de politique pour l'appropriation et l'intégration des REL. Donc, euh, nous croyons que l'action politique est particulièrement importante euh, pour faire en sorte que euh, les REL puisse être traduite, la recommandation des règles puisse être traduite en action opérationnelle. Dans le prochain slide, euh, le processus... I'm going to take a look at the process that we followed. When we started on the promotion and integration of OER in the Sahel region, we started with a preliminary study This study focuses on the governments, on public institutions, private institutions, university teachers. So we came up with a study that assesses the level of knowledge, appropriation, and use that's made of OER. And also we take a look at whether there are strategies and policies in place on OER. So that's how we started. And I'll go into further detail on that in a little while. So that was the study. And then after that, we took a look at some of the results of the study for Burkina Faso and other countries that were, or that was the country that was setting up a, a specific university in Burkina Faso. And we invited the persons involved to accompany us in the process And we did this in the context of my responsibility for the region, in other words, in the context of communication, and we encouraged the university to uh, appropriate and integrate OER. So we've been working really on the case of Burkina Faso, including on the development of a national strategy on OER. So that was the specific experience of Burkina Faso. And after that, we felt that it was important to have a sort of action plan for the five countries concerned. I said that we were focusing on these French-speaking countries, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Senegal. So that was our focus. And for those countries, we developed an action plan. To develop the action plan, we invited each of those countries officially through the uh, UNESCO National Committee chairs to indicate focal points for OER. So that was done. Then we carried out surveys involving the institutions, once again, and also through the focal points, we managed to get information 
on experience, initiatives underway, past experience, everything pertaining to OER. Following the survey, we organized a series of uh, consultation meetings with the focal points, not only to present the results of the survey, but also to come up with an action plan for the implementation of OER in the Sahel. Sahel. So this, if you like, is the process that we've been pursuing so far. And the next step will be the implementation of the action plan. Regarding the preliminary study that you can see on the next slide, I already talked about the targets of this study. So the targets were academics, members of the government, and institutions. And in the, we have been working specifically for Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Senegal. Uh, please, could you put the next slide on the screen? Because I would like to talk about the results of the preliminary study. So the preliminary study made it possible for us to realize a few things. Uh, it was conducted in 2019, and the study showed that in the region, and more specifically in the country I've mentioned, so there was a trend, an upward trend, when it comes to the use of online trainings. And so there was a strong political will with the creation of dedicated universities for online learning. So that includes virtual universities in all of those countries. And for us, it means that there is a fertile ground for the implementation of OER. However, we have observed that with the creation of online universities, there was a poor integration of OER in the national strategies and in the strategies of universities, be it in Burkina Faso, in Mali, or in Niger, or even in Senegal. This was the case for virtual universities, but also for traditional universities. They had online training, but OER were not integrated in these programs. Free resources were mostly used. So in this study, we saw that there was a clear lack of policies to integrate OER in university programs. And also among teachers and academics, we have observed that there was a poor knowledge of OER. Many people were actually confused about the definitions. They were um, actually not able to make the difference between free resources and open educational resources. And there was also a lack of skills uh, when it comes to OER. This is something that came out of this study. There was another positive element in this study. People who answered the survey said they were in favor of the integration of OER in their teaching practices. This is something important uh, that came out of this study. Many people were actually ready to use and integrate OER in their um, teaching practices. And when we asked, why there was no um, real support for OER when we asked what were the roadblocks for the use of OER and the production of OER by academics. Some said, among other reasons, I will share you the report if you want, 
They mentioned uh, the lack of incentives and support to academics and teachers for the use of OER. So this is um, a short summary of the results of this study. Next slide, please. So after the study, we started a discussion with the authorities of Burkina Faso. We presented the conclusions of the study, and we were invited uh, to support the creation of the Virtual University of Burkina Faso. And so as part of our support, uh, we created an awareness campaign for OER, and there were um, a really good reaction to this. Uh, the university uh, fully supported our program and for OER, And above and beyond the university, people decided to bring together academics, um, also coming from private universities, to develop capacities to use OER and to create OER. And we have been able to train about 50 uh, university professors in Burkina Faso so that you can use, reuse, and create open educational resources. And after this training, about 40 open educational resources were created. I don't have the exact number, but it was around 40 uh, new resources. And so, this sparked the debate. How can we make this momentum long lasting? How can we build on this momentum? And we reached a conclusion. We thought that there was a need for a national strategy on OER. So the ministry uh, brought together um, representatives of universities and the greater public to work together with us we supported them to elaborate a strategy. And so now I will talk about the main parts and elements of this strategy. So the strategy of the Ministry for Higher Education in Burkina Faso aims at promoting and integrating quality open educational resources in higher education in Burkina Faso. And here, I'd like to say that it is an OER national strategy, uh, but that is limited to higher education. So this is the national strategy. But more specifically, it was really interesting to see uh, which levers Burkina Faso wanted to use to have a full integration of OER and a successful integration of OER. So there was a first lever, public investments. And public investments must um, support um, equitable access to OER. And if you read the action plan, you will see which are the specific actions taken to support uh, the integration of OER. The strate strategy is still ongoing. And the goal is to bring together all the stakeholders within universities so that they fully understand everything that has to do with OER. And there was a debate during the elaboration of the strategy. It had to do with copyrights. During the design of the strategy, Burkina Faso thought it was important to update the legal framework uh, related to copyrights this would encourage the creation, the adoption, and the integration of OER. And this is a goal that we thought was extremely important because it creates a momentum. And an increasing number of countries will be able to promote and create open educational resources thanks to this. Finally, it was important to build capacities and expertise. This is essential. Countries need to have qualified human resources to be able to um, create, adapt, and use and reuse open educational resources. 
they also made a commitment to gradually integrate OERs in higher education. And I do remember that the virtual university of Burkina Faso, but I will have to check, but I think that the virtual university was committed to creating a certification program for teachers uh, for the production, creation, and reuse of open educational resources. I know that because of COVID-19, there were delays. I know that many initiatives um, have been delayed because of the pandemic, but there was a goal to create a certification program for teachers so that teachers through this program would be able to have access to the necessary skills uh, to use, design, and use open educational resources. And I think it's a really good initiative. They were also planning to create a master's degree with a program fully integrating open educational resources. But as I said, um, because of COVID-19, there might have been delays, and I don't know um, if this project has been implemented, but we think it's a really interesting initiative. And another goal was to take into account OERs in the quality assurance policy. It is important because we're talking about open educational resources, but these resources are important for education and other uh, fields, but we need to have quality OERs. This is why this is an important goal. Next slide. Regarding the action plan, I told you how this action plan was designed. We had focal points uh, which were appointed by countries. There were seven to eight focal points per country, representatives of ministries and higher education institutions. And so after the work done by focal points, an action plan was designed and created. It was the result of a collaboration that needs to be commended. We worked hand in hand with OER Africa, UNESCO. Everybody brought his or her own expertise and value and this made it possible uh, to really create this document I'm going to talk about now. So we started by listening to focal points to set up priorities. We didn't try to impose anything. We thought it was important uh, for focal points to tell us what was important and to build on what they told us on their priorities to work together on an action plan uh, to meet the needs that had been identified. So focal points have talked about the importance of building capacities of all the stakeholders. They were convinced and we agreed that it was important to uh, do this. It was important to create a pool of expertise it is essential to have expertise for the design and the use of OERs in the region. And here, uh, they insisted on the importance of raising awareness and training people. But it is also important to develop uh, support policies for the integration of OERs. It is also important to encourage an easy and inclusive access to OERs. It was important to have inclusive forms of open educational resources. It was also important to promote and strengthen cooperations. These were the various work streams of the action plan. And now I will talk about some of the uh, actions are undertaken um, as part of this action plan. So some of these activities have already been 
uh, started. First, it was important to write a white paper for decision makers. I don't know if the, the action plan has been shared, but Focal Points has said that it's important to raise awareness among all political leaders on the importance of open educational resources. And so it, we thought it was important to have a white paper. We also thought it was important to strengthen capacity among focal points for advocacy, advocacy on OERs, because focal points need to have the right tools uh, to do advocacy work on the integration of OERs at all levels. And then there's a question of mapping OERs and the open education and distance learning that exists in the region. We need also to come up with the handbook for procedures, a guide of good practices for development of uh, inclusive and accessible OERs. And lastly, develop and propose guidelines to public bodies uh, for different contracts to be placed for content production under an open license. I do apologize because I think I've uh, considerably exceeded my speaking time, but I come now to my last slide and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Abu. I know that we have to go, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to just ask you one question which has come up in the chat. It's a question, that, two questions, but they're the same topic basically in uh, both uh, in English and French. Uh, have you asked what kind of incentives the teachers would like to receive, and also, comment motiver les enseignants à créer, partager, exploiter les réels rémunérations, certificats ou attestations. So it's a question of how do you motivate teachers? Well, this was at the very heart of the debate during the development of the strategy. There are all sorts of different scenarios that were considered. There's one where there would be a sort of prize given to teachers. Another possibility was to include OER aspects in promotion criteria for teachers. There are lots of different examples. I don't have the full list uh, in mind, but we, we spent uh, a half day over the total of three days to precisely this question of incentives to encourage the production of OER. It's, it's a really substantive concern. There's no one answer fits all response to this. In Burkina Faso, no, there's the, this problem of uh, a mechanism to acknowledge and recognize the work carried out by teachers in uh, spreading knowledge. There are certain cases where this is included as one of the criteria for promotion possibilities, or all sorts of other ideas. And I'm, I'm sure that this is certainly not an exhaustive list that we came up with. Thank you very much for having uh, taken the time to spend with us. I know you've got another appointment, so thank you once again for your presentation. linked, of course, to OER. Dr. Atenas, your the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. Thank you very much, colleagues, for, for the invitation. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, we'll be sharing my screen. Please let me know if you can see it. Um, this uh, presentation is part of the ongoing research that I'm conducting with Leo Haberman. So it's it follows up on a publication that we uh, wrote last, last year about co-creation of open education policies. And it looks at the policy landscape after we've been analyzing around 300 policies in open education. So um, basically, how, when, when we started working in the co-creation um, uh, publication, we would try to redefine what 
uh, um, open education policies are. And for us, a region and region guidelines, regulations, strategy that seek to foster development and implementation of open educational practices, including the creation and use of open educational resources. Um, the, in, in within this, this definition, we see, we see the role of, of the government institutions uh, to, to allocate and orchestrate activities to increase access to education opportunities and promote educational quality, efficiency, and innovation. So one, when, when we think about how to drive, how to catalyze open education, um, we need to think about several factors uh, that enable or can derail uh, policy development. So we think, uh, and, 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 and looking at the literature, we, we have understood that um, OE policies need to catalyze cultural and organizational change at the institutional level, at least. Uh, but they need to be driven and uh, focused in, in social justice, social inclusion, equity, and diversity. Uh, and we think that the way to, to promote and to drive the adoption of open education and just not just create the policy, but also in, from the, the adoption of, of such practices in, in the educational uh, sector, mostly at university level, so at AG sector, is to co-create um, policies with the uh, affected people, so the, with the stakeholders, include students, librarians, uh, learning technologies, academics, teachers, anyone that may be affected that directly or indirectly by, by the policy, to uh, create opportunities for recognition and progressions for those to participate also in, in the co-creation process. So everyone feels not just um, part of the process, but also empowered by, by the process and has this sense of co-ownership. If, if we look briefly at how the, um, the state of the art, so how um, policies are um, nowadays, uh, after um, analyzing over 300 policies, we can see that all open education policies are still thin uh, on the ground. Uh, OE policies uh, um, tend to be OER focused quite a lot. OER in general not, uh, could be also textbook. And, and, some, some policies include uh, practices that relate to OER, but also to a wider range of practices. So we basically, um, through, through some research and also following uh, up the work that we did also with Fabio Nashim many few years ago, we're looking at the type of policies that to be able to analyze what's going on in, in, in the landscape at general level. So we have dedicated open education and open o, o, OER uh, policies. So policies are, policies are just driven and focused in, in the production or co-creation of, of OER. ICT policies that have a component of, of OE or open education and OER. Educational, so wider educational policies that have a component of open education. And there is sort of um, OGP, open government partnership driven policies. So it's policies that come from uh, national, national action plans or national commitments. Uh, then we, we, we have seen uh, quite a lot of uh, open policies with a component of open education that's mostly come from open access and open science. And then there is a, quite an interesting number, but I think they're developing even more um, labor market policy that also come from the vocational sector that are policies that have a strong focus in the development of skills for the job and labor market uh, using uh, catalyzed by OERs. So, um, a bit of the analysis of the policies by region. Um, the mo most of the policies can be found in North America and, and, and Europe. And, and there are, of course, some, some in South America, some in Africa, in Asia, and in Oceania. Although when we look at the scope of the policies, um, most of the policies we can see it's dedicated, so dedicated open education and, and, and OER policies, but also educational policies with an open educational component. And all in within these educational policies, also there are e-learning policies, digital learning policies, distant learning policies, so that have a component of, of open education. And then we can find um, open education embedded within open science and, and open access um, policies. But if we look by region, how they're spread around in, in, in the US or mostly North America, so US and Canada, except for Mexico, that is kind of slightly different. The most of the policies are driven by the need of creating open textbooks. So if we look at, uh, at the North America, like 
US and, US and Canada landscape, it's quite driven by the creation of text. And there are different levels of policies from um, legal bills, uh, so created by, by the different um, senates in, in the country, to institutional policies that target the same issue, the, the creation of, of, of text books. Europe is more based in, in OER in general, so most of the policies from, from the European uh, side are OER based, but interestingly, South America has a strong collection of open, ed open educational practices driven policies. So for example, this is, this is the example of, of the uh, universities in Brazil, the, the work that um, Telamil is doing, and also what uh, University of La Republica and in Uruguay are, are doing. So these are two key examples for, for the region. When, when we look at the policy infrastructure, we can see there is a sort of a pyramid of uh, layers of policy. So when you try to build policy at the institutional level, you have to be supported or your work needs to be grounded by supranational and international recommendations. So that's the work of, of, of what UNESCO has been doing, the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, the European Union, but also civil society like uh, OE Global, Open Knowledge International, Creative Commons and Spark. This uh, organizations give you the, the infrastructure and the guidelines and the recommendations of how to effectively create a policy. But then when you look at the different levels in different countries, you need to look also, of course, into the educational um, strategic priorities in each country. So it depends on the socioeconomical issues in, in each country, each region. Uh, it can be easier or, or, or not so easy to, to catalyze open education policy. And it's, that can also drive the interest for, um, for institutional priorities. So when there is a, commi a concomitance between national uh, and institutional kind of goals and aims, uh, the, the work that the uh, supranational and international organizations are doing to provide the documentation, it's what they provide kind of a solid base for the development of, of cohesive and sustainable uh, open education policies. Um, part of the study that we're doing at Leo, we're looking at the distribution of, of open education policies. So we, we can see that the most common, they're driven by priorities. So as, as we said in the case of strategic uh, priorities from country and, 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 and institution level, um, we can see that's OER policies they are like the most common and driven by priorities and open education uh, practices policy, it's driven by priority, but it's least common. Then we have open textbook uh, policies. They're very, very common and driven by the priorities in the case, for example, the excessive cost of textbooks in, 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 in the US and in Canada. And the other one is, is digital education policy. We, we have seen a boom of such policies that in, now include open education. And this is something that Dr. Cronin will show you later um, because a part of, of the work is what we're, we're analyzing in, in here. As uh, digital educations that have a strong component of open education. Although in the other side, we can see that they're driven from mandates. Um, so basically what the funder tells you that you have to do is open access policies. They're quite common and some of them, and, and this is some of the work that the, the Gemma Santos Hermoso from, from, from this community has been doing in to see where is open education within open access. Um, it, it, what, where is where it's happening in, in that in that era? So it's mostly open access uh, that has component of, of open education. Um, these are come, mostly coming from mandates, and the least common are open science strategies. Even though UNESCO launched a, a series of is launching or launched just a, a series of recommendations on open education on open science, they had a component of open education, and then least commons are OGP derived policies and labor market policies. What we, what we suggest in our research for, for um, institutions mostly at the institutional level, and this is based on the co-creation standards from Open Government Partnership, um, how to drive and how to co-create policies. We, we, we understand that or we see there are three key components, collaboration, bench learning, and engagement. Um, so if we think about collaborating with institutions, with governments, with um, experts, it's easier to drive a policy and to validate the, the, the need of a policy in, in, in a context. 
bench learning means to learn from, from others. So learning the activities and the good practices doing comparative activities to see what have worked and what has, hasn't worked before creating the policy and engage stakeholders. I think, I think this, this is key. And your stakeholders, anyone that needs to have a voice and will be impacted by, by your policy. In uh, the end of time, I will just briefly show you which kind of we consider they are the key elements of, of, of policies when you're thinking how to catalyze, how to drive, how to create your policy. Of course, you need to consider issues like copyright, the policy coherence, that your policy is in line with your national strategies, with the institutional strategies, and also with um, internal strategies through like open access and open science. So then you don't have like um, a three layer of openness in your institution that they will never be able to touch into each other. So they will basically compete for funds. Um, you need to think about pedagogic in innovation when you're thinking of how to co-create a policy, but also inclusive design, learning accreditation and diverse access to knowledge. So it's a bit of the colonized the curriculum as well. Um, one of the key elements for us is considering capacity building and promote a culture of, of openness, but also provide funding for open education. If you want to have a successful policy, you need to invest in open education. Um, otherwise, um, um, policies can fade quite easily, and the impact of the po policy can or the policies can never thrive when 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 there is no funding to support the development of of, of open educational activities in general. And of course, think about and about open infrastructure. So if you're going to have, you're going to create OER, and you're going to deploy OER, think about how, which platforms will you use? And also how the data privacy and, and, and access to information of the users of those platforms will be managed. So it's important to have components of open infrastructures and data governance for, for the use and production of, of open educational resources. So very briefly, we have this map for co-creation. This is something that we've been doing with workshop, uh, using in workshops and, and um, helping institutions and people to think about what is the best route to, to co-create a policy. And we, for, for a project that we did with UNIMED um, many years ago, we created this uh, open education policy canvas. So uh, it's accessible uh, and I will share the link of, of the presentation as soon as I finish. So where you can just download and bring it to you to the institution and start thinking how to create a table, who to bring in, and how to design your policy. And yeah, that's that's for me. And I'm I'm leaving you with um, relevant readings. And and um, if you have any any questions, please um, contact me through Twitter or just send me an email. Thank you very much, Dr. Atenia. I just wanted to point out, thank you very much for a really uh, bird's eye view of the field and of the activities going on. I just wanted to point out one thing before we move on to the next. Um, uh, the, my question, you brought up data protection, data governance, and I wanted to just point out that there is something kind of interesting. It, there's a lot of, there are a lot of interesting things in the, pol in the recommendation, but in the policy section, the last point of the policy section in the recommendation is about uh, data and privacy and uh, and its role. I'm not sure that when it was put in there, they were thinking about open infrastructure, but uh, I think there are different uh, aspects that are there. And it's interesting that you would bring it up. Um, it's rarely addressed in the discussions lately, but it is something which is going to come up more and more. Thank you very much. I think there's a question here, but I'd like to just go on. Uh, Dr. Fong uh, is the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Fong, if we could, if I could give you the floor, um, we will ask that if you could just uh, make sure that we have 15 minutes. If we could take 10 minutes each or so for the next, then we will go on perhaps 15 minutes over the hour. I hope that's okay. But we have one question here that we'll come back to afterwards. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Fong. Thank you, Janet, and also greetings to all the panelist members in this group. So I'm here to share concerning the experience that we have in Malaysia in developing the inclusive open educational resources policy. Yes. Now it begins in actually in 2018, somewhere in September, where Mr. Joe Hironaka, when I met him in Sri Lanka for a UNESCO uh, sem seminar, and he was relating concerning the Jukjana OER Action Plan 
and the need to incorporate the need of the people or person with disabilities. So we have a talk and that was how uh, the seat was implanted in me and I went back to Malaysia and I gathered a group of uh, OER practitioners from the different uh, universities in Malaysia. So we gathered together on the 28th and 29th of March 2019, okay, to come up with the first draft. And we also consulted the chair of uh, UNESCO chair for OER, and there is a Prof. Rory, who happens to be in Malaysia at that point in time. So he was there also to uh, give us a very good guideline. And on top of that, we also have uh, Diane Chambers. And Diane Chambers is one of the author for this particular book called Learning for All. And this uh, Learning for All, Guideline on the Inclusion of Learners with Disabilities in Open and Distance Learning, is also one of the main guidelines that we use uh, in our drafting of our OER policy. So we work on this uh, first draft, we got it ready. And after that, we came, uh, we had a workshop. And that is where Mr. Joe Hironaka uh, came over from uh, Paris to Kuala Lumpur. And there we gather all the OER uh, experts as well as the main key stakeholders which means uh, that uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education, the person that were there, Ministry uh, from the Special Education uh, Department, also NGOs uh, related to people with disabilities were also with us. So all in all, uh, as we went through until uh, January of uh, 2020, we actually came up with this particular policy. Next slide, please. So I'm just sharing with you the chronology of events uh, that took place. So again, on the 20th and 29th of uh, March, that's where we met with uh, Professor Rory McGrew and Diane uh, Chambers uh, actually met with us online by producing some videos and sending to us to relate her sharing in this area of inclusiveness. Then uh, after that, we had the workshop at Pullman where face-to-face -face at that point in time, we could meet. So all together, we were reviewing it very intensely, okay? And there were a lot of suggestions and recommendations, and it was uh, incorporated to become the second draft. So the second draft was uh, later on uh, recompiled, and it was sent back to all the OER experts and key stakeholders that were with us in the workshop. Okay, so it went through uh, the second draft. Then later on, you know, more suggestions came in and there was a third draft. So we continue to go round and round with these OER experts as well as the key stakeholders uh, group. Do remember that the OER expert group at that point in time are uh, Malaysian national level. Okay, then we had the fourth draft where the core OER expert group, you know, the first group that met with Professor Rory McGrew, okay, that is actually the core uh, expert group. So we look into it again and we incorporate all the suggestions accordingly. Next, please. We now bring it before the international reviewers. So that is where, uh, afterwards I'll show you the list, uh, who are they? For example, uh, Cable Green from Creative Commons was involved. Uh, the, okay, I'll just have a look at it. Then after that, uh, with more comments coming in, then we have, uh, we sent the sixth draft to all the public universities. There are 20 Malaysian public universities, okay? So, and all the relevant uh, NGOs that were involved in the workshop, as well as those that didn't attend the workshop. So we send it out to the whole nation. More suggestions came in, and we have the final review of the draft by the core OER expert group again. And thereupon we incorporate all the suggestions and final editing, and we submitted that to the Ministry of Higher Education. So if you ask uh, what was most important, 
I think that is where Dr. Atina just now was mentioning concerning the need of co-creation. And indeed, we didn't use the term co-creation, but we knew that you know the relevant key stakeholders must be with us. So that is where uh, the Ministry of uh, Higher Education, uh, they were very important. So they were with us from the very beginning. Uh, the Council for Head of E-Learning of all public universities in Malaysia, we have 20 public universities. So all the public universities, their e-learning uh, head were represented here. Okay? So that was very crucial. Then we have also the Malaysian Center for E-Learning. It's called myself under the Ministry of Education. So the president was also there. And of course, uh, we have from the National Human Rights Commission of uh, Malaysia, we call it Suhakam. Uh, we also bring in the Department of Social Welfare Malaysia, where there is a department concerning persons with disabilities. So they were there, represented. Special Education Division was there, and we also have uh, the Association for the Blind of Malaysia. We have also Fe Malaysia Federation of the Deaf, uh, the autism, autism uh, group were there, okay? So they were represented. Malaysia Education Technology Division were there. What I'm going to uh, show you is that this was co-created. I used the term by Dr. Atinas, okay? It was co-created uh, by the whole scope that are related, that are relevant. So, of course, the chair of uh, UNESCO, Professor Rory, was involved, okay? And then we have uh, Dr. Sanjaya Mishra, who gave me a lot of input because uh, when we started, we started, Dr. Sanjaya actually in 2017 did come to Malaysia, okay, to prepare a guideline, a template on guideline of preparing OER. So I was involved directly there and we stand also upon the work of the Commonwealth of Learning, okay. Uh, Gable Green was involved in the reviewing, okay. Sanjaya was also involved in the reviewing, okay. And we had very, uh, very strong uh, critique and we adjusted accordingly. Uh, we have also from Canada, uh, Professor Juta, who is an inclusive design uh, expert, okay. Uh, Diane Chamber continued to support us, okay. Okay, uh, the preamble to the National IOER policy, uh, of course, we have the national e-learning policy. We have our Malaysia Education Blueprint, uh, the Copyright Act, Commonwealth of Learning towards National Policy Guidelines, and all the relevant uh, documents came in to support our work. Next slide, please. Okay, and these are the seven main construct of the policy. Okay, and you want this policy, uh, you can get it also from uh, Janet, a copy. Uh, if we ask about some challenges, now what happened was that this particular policy was developed uh, for higher education institution. Now it was presented to the top management and the top management looking at it found that this should also be shared to research and training centers across all other ministries instead of just the Ministry of Higher Education. So because of this in 2020, uh, we have a whole cycle, you know, of uh, sharing it to all the other ministries, okay? And we have more inputs. So now it becomes an expanded version. So this is ongoing. It was only this afternoon, okay, that I was uh, also involved in uh, briefing the top management in the higher education ministry, okay? And then uh, this is the process that they, is given by the Ministry of Higher Education, okay? And they say that there will be further workshop upon this. Then the Ministry of Higher Education will look at it. If it's endorsed, then there will be a cabinet minister's memorandum that will be confirmed and that will be presented before the cabinet. And they hope that by November, it will be launched. So uh, this has been the experience that we are moving on. And it is not a completed job yet. We did it for the Malaysian, uh, for the higher education institution, but the top management feel that you know it needs to be broadened to cover all other ministries. So this is where we are at the moment. Thank you, Janet. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Fung. This is an impressive work. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, the, it, it illustrates very, very soundly the, 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 the examples given by Dr. Atenas also of the value of uh, collaborative work. And it's addressing a very important area that is to date, I believe, not addressed. I think this might be the first policy in inclusive OER in the whole world. So this is really, really impressive. And it's a, it's a very long process. So congratulations. Just, uh, I'd like to, we'll go to the questions. There are a couple of questions, but we'll go back to it. But I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Cronin. Dr. Cronin will be providing an example from Ireland on the development of um, National Approaches to Digital and Open Policy. Dr. Cronin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Thank you so much. That's great. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, it's been so stimulating so far. So thanks to all the speakers already. Um, in, in going with the aim of this webinar, uh, the title captures what I'm going to speak about. It will be you know, generally digital and open practices and policy in Ireland, but with the focus on the open and the policy. Um, so really briefly, the, I work for the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. We are a small, publicly funded, academically led body, and our remit is to lead and advise um, regarding the enhancement of teaching and learning in higher education. Um, we are, we're a neutral body, so we, this is how we describe, um, you know, the community that we work with and that we, um, that we collaborate with, and that's all who learn, so all students, all those who teach, so not just those who are defined as faculty, but lecturers on all kinds of contracts, researchers who teach, librarians who teach, postgraduate students who teach, all institution types, as you can see there, and basically our work is really done through collaboration with students, and staff and all who shape policy and practice uh, in higher education in Ireland. And I'm, I'm this, again, this is just final um, description of just the National Forum. I would say I could sum this up by mostly saying that we accomplish our work primarily through communication and collaboration. So we aim to, you know, lead enhancement of teaching and learning, but we do that by you know, continual communication and engagement with the sector and kind of following and tuning into the needs and priorities um, of the higher education sector. We conduct research, we write briefs and insights and reports, we manage funded projects, quite a number of funded projects, which, you know, which, which is allocating government funding for targeted projects. And as it says here on the slide, we work openly. So one of our tenets of how the National Forum works is that we aim to model openness and support openness. And I'll obviously say more about that. Um, and just in terms of positioning the, our work in open, in terms of our, you know, all of our work, we have four strategic priorities, and which are listed on the slide here. And our work in open really is in the teaching and learning in a digital world um, strategic priority, but it cuts across all of them. So I lead the work in that area, teaching and learning in a digital world. So it's all of our digital and open work, but our work is really collaborative across our small team of about you know, 12 to 15 people um, at any given time. So given that wide remit, um, you know, that is a challenge in terms of what we tried to accomplish in the area of open education. But you know, it's also an opportunity because Ireland, the Irish higher education sector is relatively small. So it's about 30 plus institutions. And the National Forum, you know, our team has, you know, I can genuinely say we have personal relationships with all of those institutions. So, you know, yes, you can look at some of the challenges we face, but we also think that we have some opportunities, you know, to do work, you know, nationally, which is um, what our, um, where we see our open education work. So we don't just look, um, don't just look within the sector, of course, we're informed and driven by a kind of a broad international policy context. So there's the UNESCO recommendation on OER, the call to action last year, um, of, of course. Um, these are just a few examples of some of the international policy frameworks. And these, these policy frameworks, you know, we rely on for their, um, for, for example, they explain like a commitment to the development of open, open education, um, the importance of open access policies for publicly funded resources, which National Forum uh, funded resources are. And of course, you know, a, a wealth of really excellent academic and related literature that we rely on also to inform our work. So, you know, the open, open education policies uh, work that Javiera just described, um, 
uh, work by Laura Chernowicz and others at the University of Cape Town about make open development and open education and OER and OEP. Um, Tannis Morgan about yeah, has done work around getting to open at a closed institution that's been really useful for us. Virginia Rodes, um, it's her work on the Praxis project with others. So these are just a few examples. There are there are many, um, but that's the broad. You know, we try and be informed by what's going on globally, not just in Ireland, but within Ireland. We both uh, seek to inform and then are informed by the wider policy framework. So, for example, our higher education authority um, has linked digital transformation to an increase in open access to research and resources. So that's instrumental to our work. Um, also, other um, documents which are cited there point out the importance of, again, open access policies and repositories for, for publicly funded resources. Um, we also feel that it's really important to link our work with um, uh, approaches and initiatives in the whole area of open research, open science, and open access. Again, we're a small country, and we, these are small teams of people, but you know, there we, I can say that the open research um, movement and um, embedding in higher education in Ireland is more mature than the embedding of open education. Maybe this is true everywhere. It's certainly true in Ireland. So for example, most institutions have an open access policy, but hardly any have an open educational resources policy yet. So we're trying to work hand in hand with groups like the National Open Research Forum to piggyback on the conversations that we each are having and build on existing you know, skills and understanding and infrastructures around open so that we can each you know, contribute to furthering um, one another's agendas. But so that, that dialogue we see is really key for our work. So what is the National Forum work? Um, uh, before I talk about what we're doing in the area of policy, I will say that you know the, the first of the, the five actions in the UAR, OER recommendation is about build, building capacity. And obviously, we you can't just jump to developing supportive policy. So we see this as foundational to all our work. And, and we have built on this a little bit, and we use um, we draw on work by Helen Beetham and Jisk, you know, where she uses. Um, Helen Nussbaum's work around capabilities and the capabilities approach, and, and they, they have a, the concept of digital capabilities. So we've used the narrative about building open capabilities across the higher education sector as kind of a, a foundational building block for our work. And, you know, Helen Nuss Nussbaum's definition is that capabilities are created by the combination of a person's abilities embedded in the wider social, political, economic and educational context. So for a national organization like ourself, that means engaging and supporting individuals, um, but also the institutions and organizations and the sector as a whole, influencing national policy so that we are supporting individuals, you know, developing their capacity, but develop, also supporting the development of those broader contexts within which that development can happen. So how do we do that? The first is that all National Forum funded projects are required to share their resources openly. And this simple, powerful requirement um, initiates you know, so much of the work that we do. So that opens up all the conversations to, you know, what, what do you mean by openly licensed? You know, how do I openly license? Which license do I pick? So we've developed a series of OER and OEP guides and an online resource. There's a link there. Um, to, to the online resource that we just released in March about really you know, developing OER and, and OEP uh, and to enhance teaching and learning. Um, and we're also about to tomorrow, in fact, launch a national resource hub so that all of the growing number of openly licensed resources that are developed from national forum funded projects, but also more widely um, can be shared because they're shared in institutional repositories and project websites and so on. But we have a searchable hub now, which will be launched tomorrow um, on the net, and that will be available on the National Forum website uh, tomorrow. Um, we support open professional development. Uh, the National Forum developed a professional development framework uh, to support the professional development of all who teach. Uh, in Irish higher education. And we've been, been developing over the years. I mean, I think it's over about 30 now courses and um, uh, much attention hadn't been paid in the very beginning to open licensing of those courses, but we made a commitment in, in late 2020 and, and into 2021 that all of those courses are going to be openly licensed. So, and they are now available on an open courses um, website. And then in terms of policy itself, um, again, our, our, our 
our capabilities work is very much entwined with the policy work. We have an existing national forum guide to developing enabling policies uh, for digital open teaching and learning, which supports institutional policy making in that area. Um, there's a new version to be published in September, so we've been having ongoing conversations to feed into that. And while many current issues in digital teaching and learning um, are around digital uh, topics such as lecture recording policies, virtual classroom policies, online assessment policies, particularly in the past year. Um, you know, we also bring to people's attention the importance of OER policies and, and perhaps um, updating their IP policies to support openness. So we try in our work to bring awareness of open to the broader area of digital teaching and learning policy making and to discuss how open practices and the open web affects and is affected by digital policies and that really needs to be built into the policy development process in the broad area of digital and we have a lot of attention for people around digital policy making this year so it's important we think you know to add that to the conversation so um we again <clears throat> there, there's uh, we aim to provide overall sectoral leadership we liaise with national partners in the area of open education and, and open research but there's particularly since march 2020 and you know since the pandemic came upon us you know there's a growing amount of activity across institutions in ireland um, that i would say um, a greater awareness and attention to open so I don't mean to say that all of the work that's going on around open policy making in, in Ireland is from the National Forum. So much of it is in collaboration with institutions. So there's an open scholarship community at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, Dublin City University just launched a Go Open set of support resources for their staff. Um, there's T um, Technological University of Dublin just launched an open teaching and learning repository. So, you know, we think that's really important, that kind of localized support, and we aim to provide the national strand of support and again, feed into policy making nationally. So um, we see all of this work as an opportunity for conversations. It's very much a work in progress. I don't mean to, as the previous presenter said, you know, this isn't all tied up with a bow. Um, it, this is all work that's going on as we speak. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to share it. I'd love to continue the conversation and learn from, from all the people who are here today, the presenters and the participants. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cronin. Thank you. And I see that it's, in fact, it's interesting that you say that it has, that you can't jump into developing policy because actually a lot of some, I was saying there's a good number of activities where people hear of a new concept and say, great, let's make a policy now. But in fact, there is an issue. You have to be able to have the capacity and to understand the concept. And I think one, we, I'm really sorry we, that this has, uh, we don't have as much time as we would need for this topic. But I think this is the beginning of a discussion. And what's really rich about this, uh, this development in, our, in your presentation and that of the previous speakers is that how wide this discussion is. Mm -hmm. and how diverse it is and how complicated everything is and how much entwined every all the different concepts are and from what i understand your um, the the your institution is actually supporting the development of policies and open practices and the idea is that if these po policies and open practices aren't enabled then they won't be sustainable if that's uh, that would be and that point is that we actually produce this uh, this uh, this uh, such a situation i would like to thank you very much i just looked into the chat and i don't see suddenly i don't see the questions there is a dis there is a question in the discussion about copyright but i think that's not di linked di directly to the how to deal with different dimensions of licensing and copyright issues in the development of oers i would just like to point out that the um we can share the uh we can share the the link that you have for your um, for the in your presentation. You have a link towards one of the resources you have for capacity building that you say that you've been using. And I think it's interesting that the fact that you practice what you preach has promoted capacity building in the community that you work with. So it's uh, it's all very holistic. Um, I would like to thank all of the speakers. I think in in a little bit over an hour, we have gone all over the world. We've gone.
gone through inclusive education, we've gone to the higher education sphere, we've done an overview of the entire global uh, different areas and different uh, declinations of OER policy. And we've just started, of course. And I think one thing that comes out from it is that it's a very long process. And it's a process which, uh, which requires, it's not, I think perhaps there, Dr. Cronin has put the link into the, into the chat if you'd like. Um, this, is a, this is a very long process and it's not, a it's not a process that can be tied up with a bow as, as the, Dr. Cronin pointed out. It's a process that in, if, in order to be legitimate perhaps when you're talking about open educational resources or open education has to be collaborative. And, and being collaborative means that it has to be agile and to fit into developing, into developing needs and different needs. So um, with that, I would like to thank all the participants for joining us, all the speakers for sharing your knowledge with us. And I would also like to thank the, um, the interpreters for their kind indulgence to stay 15 minutes longer. We greatly appreciate it and the technical support. Our next uh, webinar will be at the end of July, which is next month, amazingly so. And it will be focusing on sustainability. And we'll get back to you more with uh, more information on that. Thank you so much. And I'm wishing everyone a wonderful afternoon, morning, or night, or whatever time it is where you are. And have a very good uh, continuation of the day or night. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.